Well, good morning. I, I'm not sure if y'all are listening. Uh, they're not responding anyway. Good morning. Okay, that's better. Now I got your attention. So it's great to see you this morning. I, I love these kind of mornings. Uh, it might have been a little chillier than I would have liked, but I love the crispness of the morning, the sun coming out and shining. There's something that's just really nice about that. And uh, I hope that, that today is one of those days that's just a, a blessing for you and that you're able to see God at work in your life and in creation and especially in our time of worship together here. We want to take a, a few moments to lift up some announcements. Uh, the first is, if you'll uh, look at your uh, calendar, there are several items that are there. On uh, Tuesday uh, morning, the women's Bible study is beginning. So we've talked about that the last several weeks, but if you've signed up or would like to attend, there are two options for you. You can come on the Tuesday morning, or you can come Wednesday night, and that will be taking place. Um, then on uh, Tuesday evening, our finance committee's meeting. They'll be meeting at 5.30. Um, then on Wednesday, we're, we've got, obviously, the women's Bible study that's that, taking place. Uh, we've got another Bible study that Steve's leading, and it'll be up in the TV room, and that's on the book of Galatians. And then at, uh, and at between 5 and 6 o'clock, I'll be leading our confirmation class for those uh, that are fifth to sixth grade who are ready to make the decision to, to join the church. And we'll be going through uh, beliefs of the church and understanding your own beliefs. And so I want to encourage um, uh, families who have kids that age to come and be a part of that. Um, and then you'll notice on Thursday night uh, is our men's dinner, and we'll meet at uh, Napoli's Italian restaurant. Um, usually it's, you know, half dozen to a dozen of us, and we get together, have, have a meal with one another. Um, we'll, I always kind of have a devotion. I think that's related to, to our role as men uh, within uh, our own lives and in the community and within our families and how our faith uh, be, is such a central part of our lives as, as men and, and how we encourage one another another in that. And then we have just great fellowship with each other. So um, we always usually get, uh, well, we always get done by seven o'clock. It was at the other restaurant where it took so long to get the orders that we were later to seven o'clock. But um, we, you'll have a great time if you, you, you want to come join us. Um, those are our announcements. There's one other I'll, I'll share with you. Uh, uh, we're still in the process of looking for a new uh, director of children and youth ministries. We've uh, had a number of candidates apply, and some that are really good and some that are marginal. So we're in the process of kind of sorting all that out, and hopefully we'll be uh, making uh, a recommendation decision about that uh, in the coming weeks. But we're really... Uh, we're working on that diligently, so I just want to encourage you to, to hang in there in your prayers that God will guide that process, and, um, and also that as, as parents, we're going to have places where we're going to need you to step up in the gaps to help out as well, so I uh, want to encourage that word. Uh, today, um, well, then on the back of that, it seems like someone's having a birthday. I um, want to make sure we all know about that. So uh, Bruce's birthday will be coming up, and, uh, and that celebration time, I want to invite everybody to come and, and be a part of, of that day and, and help Bruce celebrate 70 years. All right. Uh, we got a little while before that's coming, though. Um, now, as we make the transition from the activities that we have going on, we want to, uh, to, to find a place of, of quiet to find a place in our, our spirit that uh, is, is not so cluttered, to uh, sit down at the table and to invite Christ to be present to us, to open up our hearts so that uh, we can be in friendship and uh, in relationship with him. So now as we begin our, our service of worship, let us have that openness in our spirit and in our life as we bring worship and praise to God. Good morning. If everyone will please stand and join me in singing our hymn of praise, How Great Thou Art.
please remain standing as we uh, recite our call to worship this morning. You can find it in your bulletin or up on the screen. The creator of the universe bids us come to worship. Let us come in awe, reverence, and eager anticipation. We are together to learn, to care for one another, and to gain strength for our common ministry. We need one another to serve God's will, and we depend on one another to carry it out. The Spirit of God is upon us, teaching and empowering. The joy of God is our strength, today and always. We open Let us take time now to greet each other in the name of Christian love. Morning, all. Good morning. Hey, good to see you. Good morning. I'm great. How about you?
When I was a boy, I used to see my grandpa build toys out of wood. And they're real simple toys, but I think it was there that the seed was planted. I have this intense desire to create things, but I was advised to become a teacher where you're in a, a building or an office or a classroom setting, something that's normal and something that the cultures can accept a lot more easily. I taught for 10 or 11 years. When I came into being a shop teacher, I basically just inherited a whole entire shed of wood. Didn't know what to do with it and was advised to throw it away because it didn't pertain to our specific curriculum that we were doing, and I couldn't throw it away. Uh, God started to download an idea on me to make a table out of this type of lumber for my wife. And I was really encouraged at that point after people saw what I had done. They kept coming by and saying, Josh, you gotta do something with this. This is, this is awesome. Don't just let this sit. It's hard to live off one salary as, a, as an educator. So I ended up taking on a, another traditional type of job, selling insurance, and just still wasn't content there. Had a hard time uh, sitting down a lot and sitting in the car and driving. My heart was so dead in the career aspect of it that I was ready to, to risk so much to, to try doing something that I loved doing. And I remember God specifically saying, stop working today for insurance, and in two weeks I will bring you orders. And uh, I started building tables, and by the end of the first week, we had an order, and by the end of the second week, we had our second order. We take old discarded lumber, old wood that most people would throw away, um, and if you see the pile of wood that's behind my shop, it, it literally looks like a dump back there. And then we'll take that old discarded lumber and we'll make it some, into something new and something beautiful. And that is such a parallel with my own story and our own lives and everyone's lives really, how we all need to be made new and need a savior. For years, what I was doing was so conflicting with what my heart wanted to do that God has put inside each one of us that we're created for a purpose. Work becomes worship when I see that I'm fulfilling what I'm supposed to be doing. I think each of us in our lives, we long for that kind of um, meaning and satisfaction in what we do with our, our day-to-day life. Sometimes we, we have glimpses of it, sometimes we live in it maybe more fully, uh, but God has a reason for each of us and has a, a purpose and a calling for our lives, and part of our, our life is to seek that, and uh, God is, is at work uh, finding it for us. And at phases of our life, it will be different. Uh, there'll be periods where uh, we might find that clearly in our work vocation. And there might be uh, after retirement that God has something entirely new for us to do uh, if we are open and we're listening. So as we come now in prayer, uh, we bring before us the concerns of the community, the concerns of our own lives, as we seek God's will for both. Let us join together in prayer. O God of light and source of beauty, you are the one who brightens our darkness. You give us rainbows after the shower. You bring the sun to cheer our mornings. O God of light, kindle a flame in us. Let us be expressions of your love and instruments of your will. Let us find our peace in knowing your place for us in our lives. O God, you are the source of beauty. Awaken us a holy space that knows wonder and awe and mystery and amusement, who's able to find joy in your presence and able to, to, to know that this is about a relationship and it's not about a set of doctrines, but this is about us having a relationship with you, something bigger than ourselves that gives us our importance and our meaning. O God, you give us light, and you are the source of all beauty. Sometimes we are shy in your presence. Sometimes we have a hard time uh, coming out of our shell to worship you. We know that we are undeserving of your favor, and yet you show us love and care anyway. You've lavished grace upon our lives beyond our measure. If we stop and understand it, we realize that our life overflows 
with thanksgiving and gratitude for every expression that you give to us. And so we bow before you and we raise our songs of praise and we hold our lives before you and those of the community. We pray for those who are broken, that your healing would be at work in their lives. Sometimes it's broken in emotion, sometimes in our relationships, sometimes in our bodies, Lord. We pray for your healing and your wholeness to come. We pray for those who are searching for meaning and for their purpose in life. We pray that your wisdom would be there and that we would slow down long enough, that we would acquaint ourselves with scripture long enough that we would be able to discern your will and your guidance in our lives. We pray for a community that's hurt and broken, for those whose lives are held captive by addiction, by other forms of struggle. We pray that, Lord, you would be at work in their lives and through us as a church to bring your liberation to those who all who are oppressed and to bring freedom to lives that are held captive. God, this is our prayer. We pray it before you now. We ask that you would give us a strong dose of confidence in your Holy Spirit as we pray the prayer your son Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from Luke in the fourth chapter. As we invite you to follow along in your own Bibles if you have them, or on the screen this morning. Let us prepare to hear God's word for us this morning. Beginning with verse 14. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee... And a report about him spread throughout all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He enrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, he sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I guess I'm getting to that age or stage in my life where um, I I was thinking about this scripture and I was going to say, you know, it's one of my favorite scriptures, but I could just about say that every week. And uh, and maybe maybe it's more that, um, you know, when you live with something long enough, it becomes a part of your your life and your soul. And... um, and, you know, when you live with someone long enough, they become so deeply a part of your life. And, and there are those things that, you know, this is one of my favorite things about that person. And maybe uh, just so much that we spend time together that it becomes that deeply a part of who we are. I pray that's it, that, uh, that the scriptures have become so much a part of my life that, that in each of them I'm able to see something that... Uh, that, that I feel very tied to and connected to. But, but this one, even though I'm long past my uh, first sermon in my home church, uh, that's what we have today. It's Jesus' uh, first sermon in his home church, his synagogue. 
Um, you remember two weeks ago, we had the Sunday that um, we, we had our baptismal font up here, and we remembered our baptism, that every one of us has been claimed by God as a child of God, and, and we remember that our baptism is something we hold to in our lives. And we remember that in the baptismal covenant, it says that we are baptized with water and the Spirit, um, that the Holy Spirit uh, is, is we are, when we are baptized, the Holy Spirit comes into our life, and it's that sense of God's presence and guidance and leading, and uh, those moments when we feel our conscience pushing us towards something, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. God, God's Spirit works in us in so many different ways, and so last week then, after having talked about our baptism, last week we talked about gifts of the Spirit that are given. And that um, if we are baptized by water and the Spirit, then the Spirit uh, grants gifts to us, spiritual gifts in our lives. And we looked at some of those. I hope some of you went on and took that uh, assessment, spiritual gifts assessment. Um, I know that that Steve did because he sent me the results. Um, Wisdom was his biggest gift. I think he, you know, that that was what they they were sharing. Uh, yeah, Liz is laughing, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, our, our spouses can have that kind of laughter with us, right? Um, you know, the, we were, at, I'm on the team for this upcoming uh, walk to Emmaus for the men's and the, the women's walk, and the, 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 the preacher for yesterday in our uh, team meeting was talking about laughter, and you remember Sarah. Um, this is my sidetrack I get to take, but, you know, that Sarah... Uh, laughed whenever God um, said that she was going to to have a child in her old age. And and it reminded me, you know, there really are two kinds of laughter. There's cynical laughter when we are laughed at. And, and, and then there's joyful laughter when we laugh together. And, um, and hers was, maybe at first it felt a little like cynical laughter, that, fi- you know, finally in my old age, God, you're going to do this. But it became joyful laughter in her life, wasn't it? And, and because as she says, you know, they named him Jacob, and, uh, and which um, means laughter, and, and that everyone will laugh with me, right? You know, that everyone will laugh with me. And that's the kind of laughter we have uh, with one another. And, uh, and uh, or I, Isaac, isn't it right? I, I got confused there. And, um, but, uh, so the, we, we have this laughter with one another. And uh, hopefully that's what we're feeling there, Liz, right? Is that kind of joyful laughter? Yeah, yeah amen, all right. <laughs> so we, we, you know, we talked about gifts of the Spirit. And, um, and, and if you didn't, you know, there's still time. You can go back and, and do the, the, uh, the assessment if you want to. Um, but we realized that we have these spiritual gifts in our life. And... and um, and Jesus, he had gone out, he had been to be baptized in the wilderness by John, and then he went out into the wilderness further for 40 days um, to be alone, uh, to, to deal with the inner workings of the Spirit, to make sure he was in tune with God's direction for his life, out there in the wilderness and uh, tempted uh, making sure that the calling he was hearing in his life was true and forged by the fire, if you will, of, of the wilderness and temptation. Sometimes we need that in our lives. We need the moment to pull away so that we can draw closer to what it is that God uh, wants us to see. And so he did. And now he's returned and he's come back. And, um, and he's come back to his home. Uh, you, we know what it's like, don't we, to return home? Uh, to return home uh, can, can feel very good. It can feel very comforting uh, to return home after we've been away. But sometimes uh, the people that we've known throughout our lives have, uh, if you will, an image of us or a set of clothes for us that no longer fit. Um, they're not the ones that we've grown and we're at a different place, and Jesus returns home, and he's uh, both familiar, and it says everybody spoke so well of him, you know, and thought so good of him, and he returns to his home synagogue, as was his practice. Um, I don't want to nag, 
But, but isn't that kind of what it was for Jesus that, that uh, he, when it came to be the Sabbath, he found himself in the synagogue, which was where he was supposed to be. And that's, that's for us what Sunday is when we come back to, to worship and we put ourselves in the place where we are supposed to be, as was his custom. He came to the synagogue. He came to church, and he was there. And it doesn't tell us why. Um, Jesus had been a part of the synagogue his whole life. There's the people he knew. His family was there. Um, friends he'd had all his life were there. Um, Maybe it was his turn to read the scripture. Maybe it was just the Sunday that it was his turn to get up to do that. Maybe, maybe somebody saw something different in him when he came back and said, you know, we need to hear from you. But it says he was given the scripture, the scroll of, uh, of Isaiah to read. And, and so he does. It's kind of interesting because um, my Bible is this big. This Bible is. I've got others that are bigger, but this is the one that if I keep my glasses with me, I can use and read. And, um, and there's something about it that's very comfortable and, and very good. But, and, and one small part of this is Isaiah. Um, Right. And, and, and in this section of Isaiah, just about, about that width is, is, the, is the prophet Isaiah. And that's kind of amazing, you know, in the, just those few chapters, you can have the whole thing. In Jesus' day, they didn't have this. They didn't have anything close to this. When it says they brought him the scroll, and we think about the, the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, the, 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 the scrolls, and, and maybe it was God kind of saying, this is most important for you to learn. But when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls at Qumran in the cave, the first of the scrolls they found was the prophet Isaiah. And uh, it was the very first one they brought out. Um, but on these scrolls, so in his synagogue, he would have been there. And this, this would have been written down by someone long ago and would have been passed down. People didn't own Bibles. Jesus wouldn't have had a Bible. No one had a Bible. Um, the only place you had it was in the synagogue. And so it, he was handed the synagogue. And it probably would have weighed close to 50 pounds. The one scroll of the, of the prophet Isaiah that we have from the Dead Sea Scrolls, when it's unrolled, is 24 feet long. So, I mean, we're talking about, and it's on a heavy paper, and you've got to have the poles to hold it on and to roll it and unroll it. So, so Jesus is given the scroll to read. Can you imagine him? You know, he's taking it. This is physical reading of the scripture. I mean, he, his muscles will be sore if he holds it up too long, you know? And I'm sure there was probably a table in which he then was able to rest it on and unroll it and unroll it, and unroll it, until he got to chapter 61. Um, maybe it's like our Bible up here that's open to the middle, happens to be to the Psalms today, so it wouldn't be much of a switch to get from there to, to Isaiah. But, so maybe it was in the middle of Isaiah somewhere, but he's unrolling the scroll. Uh, it takes a moment to do that. It takes a little while. Um, we move quickly in our worship service to try to get out in about an hour, hour and 15 minutes time. Um, we don't allow a lot of pauses to move around, but this would have taken a while. Um, reminds me, the first church I'd served, Penn Avenue, uh, a lady who came to serve there later because it became Penn Avenue Redemption Church, a ministry to those who were out of prison. And um, she was a former um, prisoner herself. She had been incarcerated for about 15 years, and while she was in prison, uh, came to hear God's calling in her life, and, and um, through the ministry of the Methodist Church, uh, was able to have a significantly different life coming out of prison than when she went in. And in fact, so much so that she felt to call to ministry. 
She'd never been to college in her life, and she went to college, went to seminary, became a pastor. But she'd served that church, and some of the folks who were part of the congregation that were still there and weren't the ex-offenders that became a part of it, it was all blended together, some of that group together. She said, you know, they complain that I pray too long in the service, that I pray too long, too much. She says, can you imagine anyone complaining that this ex-prostitute who spent all this time in prison is praying too much. And, uh, and you know, we, we run a pretty tight service. You give me a lot of freedom and room in the sermon, so I appreciate that. But there Jesus was. He's unrolling the scroll, and he's taking his time as he gets to it, and, and he reads it. We don't know if it was the signed reading for the day, uh, in the synagogues, they did that. They would try to divide up the readings of the scripture so that different ones were read at different times. It's, it's possible it's that. Or maybe he chose it, but he reads it. And he reads it and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Doesn't that sound like Jesus' mission statement? I mean, isn't that what Jesus is all about? Coming to preach good news to us, to the poor, to the wealthy. A ministry that reaches out to everybody to preach good news to the poor. Recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce at the time of the year of the Lord's favor. All those things that Jesus comes to do, uh, to bring us. And, and it's all right there at the beginning in his first sermon, back home in his church. And, and after he reads it, it says he sits down and they all were amazed. Now what doesn't go on to is that he kept preaching and he got a little in their business and they got mad at him. You know, because uh, he, he got into the places that they were uncomfortable hearing about, too. Um, someone said that the, the, the definition of the gospel is to uh, um, comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. And uh, there's, there's a bit of that in Jesus, isn't it? I mean, the places where we get too comfortable in our lives, he comes and he speaks a word that we would just as soon not hear. We'd rather not hear it because it doesn't fit easily into our lives. Good news isn't always happy news. Sometimes it costs us something. It asks something of us that, that we would rather not do. Um, love your enemy. Wow. The things that Jesus brings and he teaches are about, uh, about a real different way of living. And some of it's easy, some of it to embrace grace in our lives where we have messed up and to know that we are forgiven. That's the easiest part if we allow ourselves. Sometimes, you know, we have a hard time forgiving ourselves, but to allow ourselves to be forgiven is easy compared to forgiving our enemies and those who've hurt us and offended us. That's the hard part. We don't get to just take one piece of it or the other. Um, I thought about leaving all that out, you know, since we, it, you, know, you can only focus on so much, but, but it seems so es essential to the message, isn't it? Uh, that Jesus pushes us and pushes us to grow in ways sometimes that we would just as soon not. And so he's taking this very physical act of rolling out the scroll and reading from it and, um, and, and proclaiming that that in our hearing today, it's fulfilled in who Jesus is. Maybe it's fulfilled in every moment. Maybe Jesus is God's transformation in the world that reaches us in every moment of life uh, to, to bring things and to change the way we see and the way we live, uh, to, to, to look for brokenness and to help find healing. Um, he's in his hometown Maybe, I think maybe the greatest testimony or proof to Jesus being the Christ is that even his own brother believed in him. You know, 
I, I don't know about your relationships to your brother or sister, but uh, sometimes the hardest person in life to convince could be our brother or sister. Now, his mom's still a follower, devoted. Um, you know, I think many of us can understand that. We know mom's got our back, but, uh, but even his brother um, is a person of faith and one of the disciples. Jesus is welcomed back home and received And the mission is set forth, good news to the poor, release to the captives, freedom for the oppressed. We read it today like Jesus in our hometown, right? Can we put up that first image? Thanks, Sherry. This is our hometown, isn't it, Chickasha? Um, You know, we... Got little different parts of it, but basically the center part of our community. And, and not every one of you live exactly inside those lines, you know. Uh, and obviously the ministry of our church reaches out, but, but that's, it. that's our hometown. And it's in this place that God uh, preaches that word to us today. To preach good news to the poor, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind. What would it mean For Jesus to let the oppressed go free, those who are captive, held captive by something in this community, and call us to be a part of that, to be Jesus' ministry in this place, in that community. Um, One of the things that, as I was looking at that and thinking about it, how is it that we as a church uh, reach out to that group of people who cover that space? Do we know who they are? Um, Some of them we do, some we don't. Uh, This is our responsibility, if you will. God's assigned us here and said, here's where you get to carry out my mission and ministry in this place. Doesn't mean it's limited to it. We can take a mission trip to some other place, and that's great and fine. But this is our primary place of mission, where we are to serve. Um, what, What ways is God in your baptism with water and the Spirit sets you about to be a minister of His in this community? Uh, what gifts of the Spirit has God given to you to be able to use and serve in, in this community? Um, so who are these folks? Well, we get some help on learning a bit about that. And um, let's go to the, the next image. Now, this is probably two a uh, small text for you to read, but I want, I'll read it to you. Um, see that biggest blue portion? That's the, uh, the biggest segment of our community. And uh, whenever you, you have demographic folks do a study of Chickasha, they like to put folks into different segments and say, here's what this group of people are like. So this first one is, uh, they give them all different categories and numbers. But this is the, they call the pastoral pride group, and, uh, or true grit Americans. So there's a larger segment and then smaller segments. Uh, so pastoral pride covers about four areas. And in that, one of those is the uh, true grit Americans. And, and just so, I've got some stuff to talk about each of these. I'm going to do it quickly. We're not going to spend a great deal of time. But, but enough so that you get a picture These folks are older, middle-class households, town and country people, located in the nation's midsection. Okay, that's that's us. Uh, Older, middle-class households, uh, earning between thirty-five and sixty thousand dollars a year for the most part. Um, Interestingly enough, more of these are single people in the household than are couples. They're not families because their kids are grown and moved on in that way, but, but, but there are more single than there are couples in this age bracket. Uh, folks who uh, have lost a spouse, folks who uh, maybe have uh, gone through a divorce, they're, they're on their own. Um, although many of them are couples as well, but they're more single than they are um, 
than they are folks who are, have, have companionship in their lives. That may be some, saying something about what the heart needs in their life are is for community and connection. They have people that they need to be connected to. Um, this may not surprise you. On the technology adaptability, uh, they're, they're novices. They're low on the spectrum. They're, they're not the technological uh, savvy folks. They're, they're low on that, that spectrum. And they, they watch a good bit of television. Um, uh, they live within their means, and they're very pragmatic. They're hardworking people. They've gone through, uh, uh, they know what it is to put a full day's work in. Uh, True Grit Americans. The, the next section are, um, a section they call, that fits into is um, economically challenged. And, uh, and this one is, they, the, the, the tag they use is small town, shallow pockets. Um, you ever felt that? Small town, shallow pockets. Uh, this group, generally, they're older singles, empty nesters, living on modest, modest, and I like this phrase, exurban, I'm not sure, exurban small towns. So I guess Chickasha would be exurban. We're past the suburbs, um, out as a small town from there. Um, many of these have an annual household income of, of less than $15,000. Uh, again, low on the technological adapters. Single and empty, empty nesters, modest education, um, love rodeos and fairs. Uh, they they have, have worked hard in their lives as well. Um, generally, between 55 and 65. Um, many are renters. They may not own their own homes. Um, they've, uh, but this is the second largest. That's that orangish red color where it looks like you get to about 50% of our community fall in these first two categories. Uh, you know, they're... They're folks who have uh, joy in their life, but they also um, have some real needs in their life. Uh, health care is one of their primary concerns. Most of them, many, do not have health care until they get up to 65 and are able to, to get on, on Medicaid. Um, those are some of the folks in our, our community. What does God's um, call to bring good news to those folks mean? Oh, by the way, there is kind of fun. The first ones, they give kind of names to these people. The first ones are Jim and Cindy. Roger and Connie are the middle, the next one. Um, the, the third group in there, uh, Golden Year Guardians, town elders. These are our town elders. I can look out here and see a few of those. Um, these are, are folks, uh, they are stable uh, it says minimalist seniors, but they're, I think what that means, they live within their means, uh, living in older homes and, and leading a pretty sedentary life. Uh, they watch a lot of television. They're um, 76 plus. Uh, these are the third largest segment of people in our community um, that, that are here. What's their need in life? What is it that, that, that we can help bring good news to them? Um, again, they are more single than they are married, although there are many married in this category. Uh, hardly know what the internet is. Uh, they're not, not interested. It's not been needed in their life. Um, that's, that's a part health care purchases are uh, a big part of what they spend time on and think about. Many have, uh, have pensions because they worked in places where they, they did. Uh, that was Harold and Helen, by the way. The, the next one, um, it's interesting, all three of those were older on the spectrum than you might have expected. The, the next category, the, the, f the fourth of these, is uh, families in motion. And the tag they give this one is diapers and debit cards. And um, these, are, these are young families. They're young families, and they're, uh, they're making it from paycheck to paycheck. They're, they're working hard in their lives. Their incomes are between twenty five and $35,000. Uh, again, fairly modest. Um, oftentimes, they're, more often than not, they're renting. Um, they're not, they don't own their homes. Uh, 
They like watching reality television. Their children are, are very young. Uh, they might be a part of a bowling league, it says, or the pool, uh, uh, like to play pool. Um, a lot of home-based family activities. These are wizards on the social media side of it. They are um, easy adapters of technology. So they've got their cell phones, they know how to get on Google, do all those kinds of things that are needed. They can run their life from their phone, basically. And, and in the households are many or five plus. Uh, they're, they're young families with several children. Um, again, more singles than those who are married. Uh, more single family parents um, working their way to get by. Uh, this, who, what is it these people are needing? What's the ministry of the church to reach out to them? There are uh, Nicholas and Tiffany. Um, this one shocked me. Uh, the next category, and now we're getting down to about 5% of the population but uh, is the singles and starters, and these are digital dependents. Generation Y and X, single, uh, they live digitally driven lives. They're making between 35 and, and $55,000. They're uh, in professional jobs, they're, uh, but they're single. Um, I, I wonder if the influence of the college maybe is a part of that. Uh, do many of the students maybe fit the beginning stage of, of this category? They're ambitious. Appearances are important. They're single adults. They're eager to spend money. They love music. They're digitally savvy. Um, they're starting to be first-time home buyers. They're, 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 they're making good money in their life, and they're... they're, they're wanting to purchase a house. Um, it's fascinating, and the personal experience of this. Thomas, um, he, he and his, his roommate in Oklahoma City, they had kind of a falling out. Thomas has been uh, staying with us for a few weeks, and, and he's been thinking about what he wants to do. He's like, you know, I think I should buy a condo. You know, how much money do I need to have to, you know, for a down payment? So we're talking about, you know, those kinds of things with him, because he just gotten a promotion at work. He's 26 years old, he's making more money than he's ever seen in his life, and um, he's trying to figure out what's the next step. Um, kind of fits that category. Folks in their, their 20s uh, doing well, working hard, um, ready to, to make that move. They're single, and, um, and, and what is the place that we can share good news to them? Good news to the poor, the broken, the lost. I, uh, I don't know, something about the scripture, something about Jesus um, starting off his ministry and coming to his home church and reading the scripture and saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me and this is what we need to be doing and um, this is what God has called us to be. I just wonder, uh, where do we hear God's calling in our lives? And in this community, where as a church can we uh, figure out how we reach out to these folks? Not just so we have more people in the pews, uh, but because they are real needs and hurts in their life that Christ can be the answer for. Christ can be the fullness of meaning in their life so that they're not just searching for the things that seem obvious, but they're finding that which is most important and real. Um, I, I say this with more questions than answers. I wish I had answers. Um, maybe what we need to do is just really spend some time praying diligently that God would find for us the right ways to, to share and to reach out. I think the first part's trying to be aware and trying to know, but how's it we reach out and connect? I think we're ripe. As Jesus said, it's ripe for the harvest. There are places where we can connect. And it may not look like other ways that we've done in the past, but God's calling us, I think, to look ahead and to find ways to connect. Um, I hope we have the means to do so. Amen. If you will please stand and join me in singing our hymn of response, To God Be the Glory.
It's uh, amazing the, the way that, that God works in our lives. Uh, you think about the heart. The heart, um, which pumps the blood through our body, uh, is in a constant stage of, of receiving and sending out. Receiving and sending out. Giving and receiving. Um, our life is, is that way. We receive from God all that we have in our lives. We, his grace is poured out upon our lives. What we uh, provide, he provides for us and our resources come to us from him. And so now we have an opportunity to give. We've received and now we can give uh, that heartbeat rhythm of life. As we do so, I invite you to, um, to do so with joy, to let uh, the gifts that you now share be signs of your life given to Christ's service. Let's prepare ourselves for the morning offering.
If you would, please remain standing as we proclaim our faith with the modern affirmation this morning. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all His works, and whose will is ever directed to His children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as a divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. If you will remain standing, we're going to do our song of sending forth, Burn in Me. Let us 
some good. 